thanks for the introduction. I see the Swedish people are even more precise with the time than the Swiss. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, conversational search or search-based conversation. And uh, particular for this system that we have at Google, uh, something that triggers when you say, OK, Google, on over half a billion devices right now. So it's uh, smart speakers, phones, uh, tablets, watches, uh, TVs, all of these things. And these surfaces, uh, they pose some unique challenges. So uh, first of all, it's uh, voice input. So the user is uh, often not typing their uh, question. They're asking it by voice. And it can be in a noisy room, and you know we have to understand what they're asking. It can be that we don't have screen output. We only have a voice uh, channel, so we can only talk to them, like the Google Home device that you see on the uh, left. Uh, and finally, the expectations are uh, a bit different. So the users are expecting this system to be human-like, to understand the context, to be personal, and we have to deal with all these challenges. But that's quite exciting, actually. Uh, one might think that an easy approach uh, to solve this problem would be neural networks. So you start uh, completely end-to-end -end fashion, you use lots of training data, and then you train the system. And that's in fact, is an active area of research. But so far in production, it's worked well only in a few limited areas. So one of them is the um, narrow domain. Like you have a siloed experience, like restaurant booking, for instance. There is this Google duplex system that can help people to book a restaurant, but there, the, uh, there is a very limited vocabulary, first of all, and uh, the users, they are kind of in this experience. So once they get inside it, they can either succeed or uh, they fail or they cancel the interaction. And on the other end of the spectrum, there is this uh, chit chat bots. So you have this uh, conversation with the system just for the sake of conversation, mostly. So you spend time talking to these bots, and a good example is Microsoft through or Show Ice bots. The problem with this uh, approach is that if your system didn't see something in the training data, like here the user is asking about a definition of a certain world or a certain word, if the, the system didn't see it in the training data, it won't be able to answer it correctly. And even worse, it might answer it uh, in a very likable, uh, very trustable fashion. It will find something in the training data and uh, come up with something trustable, but it will be ultimately wrong, and uh, that's not something that we want to ship to production. So uh, instead, in our team, we focused on a different approach. We decided to start with something that Google has always been good at. And here on this picture, you see how the search page evolved uh, from the 90s to something like it looks today. So that's a, a result page for my hometown, and you see it has uh, images, uh, maps, uh, some facts, uh, weather, news, and all of this. There is a lot of uh, research in academia as well as in the industry. I, I did my PhD on it. Uh, that's been put into optimizing these components. So you know uh, there is a lot of user-based model that are in play here that decide which components to show, which order, uh, and so on. And it's only natural to assume that if you want to build a conversational system, we should really leverage the power of search that we have here. And OK, one might think that that's easy, but we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to uh, just go and start reading from the search page, because that will be really hard to listen to. It will be very tedious. And uh, we don't want to uh, use too many words when few words would do. So that brings to the first part that we need to address is the answer adaptation. We need to uh, convert uh, an answer that you see it on the search page. So here's an example. The user typed a query uh, about release date of PlayStation 4. And we get a uh, good enough snippet, so the search s short summary of a web page, which answers the user query and gives some more context. But if the user is interacting with the system, they're expecting to get one short, concise, and to the point response, like the one below. Uh, so for that, we've built a, uh, a system that does exactly that. It's an encoder-decoder architecture neural network uh, that takes the, the snippet as it appears on the search, and uh, importantly, the user query, what user asked, and then summarizes it. So uh, we come from something uh, up there to something below, where we say, just give the date uh, the answer. 
and uh, that already helps a lot. What we can also do on top is, uh, here you see that uh, in search we highlight some things like dates. We could also do it on, in the assistant when we speak. We could uh, just highlight, put, read some words slower or make some pauses around them or you read them with emphasis. So here we can read the date with emphasis and in fact we've published uh, work on both of these on summarization and um, highlighting that shows that uh, indeed the users understand the, uh, the answer better and uh, they're more happy with the experience overall. Uh, to put it into uh, an instruction, we identified the three steps how we address these kind of problems. And if you just uh, woke up in the middle of the presentation and you see the slides, that's great uh, because uh, that's the most important uh, slide, I think, here. So we identify these three steps. Uh, each of them is, is important. So first, we start with, the, with search. We know that uh, there's a lot of effort put into a search system. And you can potentially apply it to other areas where you have some system that works well and then you uh, uh, start from it. So you start by, uh, here in this example for summarization, you start by looking at the existing uh, search snippets, these short summaries. Some of them are short, some of them are long, and then you could use this to train a model uh, to approximate long ones from short ones. But it's not enough. You have to go further. You have to go and use uh, page raters uh, or crowdsourcing uh, in general to uh, understand whether you are indeed uh, answering the original question, whether this summarization helps. So for that, you need to spend some time uh, investing into uh, spend some time designing the, the template, uh, the instructions for the, uh, for the raters. And in our team, we, we published, a colleague of mine published a blog post in Google AI blog uh, on the instruction that we use for that, uh, how we make sure that the raters uh, give us precise uh, ratings and they, we learn something from that, how we can use it for uh, fine-tuning the model. Once that is done, you, have, you go to the next step, which is equally as important. Uh, you first start with maybe 1% experiment where you launch your uh, new system uh, to production and you learn from the real users. You see how they interact. They are quite different from the paid raters. And if they say that, oh, you're summariz summarizing too much, they might be saying, oh, tell me more. Uh, or they just give in general uh, feedback like, oh, that was great. Or they use some other words to say that it wasn't great. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you use this data first to understand how well you're doing, but also to uh, propagate it back to your system and use it for training, like uh, when you should summarize, when you shouldn't summarize, on how much you should summarize. So you use the raters, uh, use the users and the, uh, the feedback that you get from them uh, to keep improving your model. So that's, uh, that's uh, great. We know how to make the answers better, but sometimes one answer is just not enough. We cannot possibly uh, tell the story uh, in just one shot, right? We need to engage in a dialogue with the user. Or maybe the user wants to talk to us. They, they don't want to uh, just give, get one short answer. Uh, sometimes, like, uh, people ask, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, they ask a short question, but they actually want to start a conversation, right? Uh, uh, and here, the same. So. Consider the following example. We have a user, let's call her Gina, and uh, Gina has a task in mind. She needs to boil an egg. So she puts it and then uh, she uses the system to uh, set a timer, but then she doesn't know uh, for how long. So she goes and asks a question and only then sets a timer. So here we cannot uh, use the same um, uh, restaurant booking uh, settings because the task is complex and there are several subtasks that are uh, intertwined here. So there is this timer setting uh, subtask and there is also question answering subtask. And you need to make sure that your system uh, is passing context correctly. So you know that uh, when the user says uh, make it 10, it's the user is referring to the timer, uh, something that you were talking on before. And they shouldn't be able to say again, OK, Google set the timer. Um, Sorry about that if I triggered someone's phone. <laughs> um, and here, uh, so we need to keep all this in mind. Uh, context passing, sometimes personalization, and uh, complex overlapping tasks that we need to address. And if you uh, zoom out a little bit and see uh, how the dialogue system is set up, it usually has all these components. So that's something that uh, people uh, keep going 
over and over again. So there is the voice recognition when we convert the audio into words. Then there is a natural language understanding. So when we analyze the words that users said, like they said weather in Sevastopol, we want to understand that they are requesting a weather. Uh, we want to trigger the weather module of our system. And they're referring to a particular entity. Like if I'm asking this query, I'm probably interested about the weather in my hometown, not Sevastopol in California or Indiana or I don't know, where in the US they have uh, the city with the same name. They actually do have in these two states, at least. Uh, and then once we understood, uh, we parsed the query, we go to the uh, dialogue state, what we were talking about before, what are the things that we mentioned or the user mentioned, and we update it. And uh, the, dialogue, uh, uh, the dialogue policy is the kind of the brain of the system. It decides based on what the user said and based on what we were talking on before, what should we say next? And then the natural language generation puts uh, this desire into words. So we decide, OK, we want to inform the user about the weather. And uh, the natural language generation decides which words we use to tell about the weather. And then finally, text-to-speech makes uh, audio out of it. So in our team, we are mostly focused on the right part, so how we, like the brain of the system, as I like to call it. And uh, how we design it? Uh, well. Uh, we use the same three steps. Someone uh, said earlier at this conference, uh, you try something, it works for you, and then you call it a strategy. So use this um, strategy to uh, build uh, dialogue systems. And this is the same, uh, the same three steps as I talked about before. So again, if you only have to remember one slide from my talk, uh, please remember this one. So we start with search. If you're talking about uh, conversations like let's let's consider uh, example about uh, uh, movies so we go and we know that the search page for movies it has lots of different information so we as uh, engineers researchers decide how to uh, put this information how to present it in a conversational manner uh, once we took this information we go to the raters and then we use them to uh, help us to bootstrap our model so for instance for uh, uh, natural language understanding, when we want to understand what the user asked, we could uh, go to the writers and say, hey, what are the possible ways how the users could uh, ask about the weather in a particular city or about movies in a particular city? So we can uh, use this kind of crowdsourcing to bootstrap the, the uh, machine learned model for natural language understanding. And we can also use these uh, writers to uh, vet some initial design choices. Like we tried, uh, for instance, asking the user lots of questions or uh, waiting for them to give us the constraints. So we can try all that in a kind of offline lab settings where we could have very controlled, uh, very fine-grained understanding on how are we doing. And once that is done, we go again to the next step, the final step. And that's even more important here because uh, once you are uh, have this dialogue, it can evolve in so many different ways. And it, you cannot possibly try all of them uh, in the lab, like with your paid raters. You have to uh, take some risk and uh, try it on the real users. But then you get a real uh, feedback that you cannot get uh, in the lab. Also, personalization, extremely hard to test in the lab. You can only uh, more or less try it uh, with the real users. So here, uh, you go and launch it as first as a small experiment, and then you see how you're doing. So if the users are uh, happy, they're going to tell you that, or you can ask them. Just make sure that you don't do it too much. Uh, here in, at Google Assistant, we do it very rarely. So maybe if you're even using Google Assistant regularly, you haven't seen, seen it much when we ask you the question. But it could be that we say, hey, how was the interaction? And then the users give us very explicit feedback. And that's very valuable. We use it to understand uh, the quality of the system, but also to improve it. Like, should we have asked the, the user this question, or should we have suggested something else? And to put this into practice, uh, here's how this uh, strategy worked for us uh, when we designed the movie experience in our team. Uh, again, of course, we didn't have this strategy when we started. We just uh, tried some things that worked, and it that did work. So the user is asking about the movies, and uh, uh, we give them some suggestions. We, again, decided how, much, how many movies we want to suggest. So we, I guess we mostly suggest three, uh, maybe one for some users. And then they said, uh, OK, I want something funny. So first it's uh, personalization, but also some narrowing down. So we. Uh, give them one movie, let's say, and then they ask who plays in it, uh, and then we reply, and then they say, okay, I want to go tonight and uh, buy tickets, perhaps. 
And in the end, uh, uh, this is just for the sake of example, we uh, rarely do that, as I said. We ask, uh, how was your interaction with the assistant? And here there are several components, uh, several parts, uh, important uh, parts that I talked about before. So first of all is the context. Uh, we want to make sure that when the user is referring uh, to the movie as it, even though they never mentioned it before even, right? We, something that we suggested, and it was even a different uh, component. So there was the movies component and the question answering component. You want to make sure that we still uh, have this in the, uh, in the state. So this is uh, something, the dialogue state has the entities, uh, movies that we were talking about, and some other things uh, that were mentioned previously in the conversation. And uh, when they go back to the movie's experience, we want to make sure that not only we remember which movie we were talking about, but also which cinema or which time. If they, if they suddenly change their mind and say, oh, I actually want to see an action movie, but they already settled on a particular cinema and particular day, we want to make sure that all of this is stored in the context. And when, once we are coming back from the question answering module to the main uh, uh, movies in this case, uh, experience, we remember all of that. And here also when they agree, uh, they, want, they say, I want to go tonight. First, it's a context uh, because uh, the, they want to, talk, to go tonight to see that movie, right? They just don't want to go tonight anywhere. Uh, but it's also implicit feedback. So they agreed to something that we suggested. So we use it, uh, we propagate it back to the uh, personalization suggestion model that uh, learns from that user feedback, uh, learns that uh, the suggestion was indeed good. And if they didn't accept, uh, then uh, we also use that as a signal. And there is also explicit feedback here. So they, we asked them how we were doing, and we got a very concrete rating that, uh, that was five stars. So, to summarize, uh, if you want to build something that is smart, so a system that is uh, uh, able to answer questions in a conversational manner, uh, the approach that worked for us now, uh, it might be something different in the future. So in, also in our company, we're investing a lot into uh, neural network end-to-end -end approach uh, and trying to uh, augment it with the knowledge base. So far, this approach has worked better. We start with something that is already established, uh, in this case, search, and then you invest in making it conversational. So you first use uh, the raters uh, to kind of bootstrap the model to train some of the uh, components. And then you uh, go and launch uh, this model first as a small experiment, and then you try different things, and you learn from the user feedback. When they, when they say that they're happy, you use it uh, to fine tune your model. And uh, last but not least, I want to uh, uh, advertise for a workshop that I'm uh, uh, involved in co-organizing. So that's uh, going to be in May in San Francisco, um, uh, together with the Web Search Conference, uh, one of the bigger research conferences. And uh, in particular for us, we are going to focus on conversational AI. And we have uh, speakers from uh, Amazon, Samsung, UC Davis, and uh, three or four conversational startups. So, And yeah, uh, finally, if you cannot go to San Francisco in May, uh, we have uh, uh, another edition of the same uh, workshop, a bigger edition in August in, uh, in Macau, China, in the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.